Hey, everybody, it's Ed. Before we get started, I've got more Patreon supporters I want to thank. John Hunley, Brett Richman, and Josh Olson. These guys went to mountainandprairie.com slash support and clicked on the Patreon button, and they are now supporting the podcast on a monthly basis, which I really, really, really appreciate. If you want to learn more about any of those options, go to mountainandprairie.com slash support. Thank you very much. Hey, this is Ed Robertson, and this is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast, where I introduce you to some of the innovative individuals who are shaping the future of the American West. I meet most of these people through my work in land conservation or through my hobbies and interests that revolve around spending time up high in the mountains. My guests include ranchers, writers, entrepreneurs, conservationists, athletes, artists, adventurers, pretty much anyone who's doing important work, has an interesting story, and loves the American West. My guest today is Elliot Woods. Elliot is a Montana-based veteran and multimedia journalist who's reported for publications including Outside, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and many more. His most recent project is a podcast called Third Squad, which tells the powerful story of, quote, one journalist, 12 Marines, and two decades of war. Back in 2011, Elliot was an embedded journalist with a group of Marines who were positioned deep in one of Afghanistan's most dangerous regions. Nearly a decade later, Elliot embarked on a cross-country road trip to reunite with the surviving members of the team and talk about how that violent deployment impacted their lives. Third Squad tells the stories of these Marines, offering raw insights into the impact of war on individual soldiers, both on the battlefield and back at home. Elliot was born and raised on the East Coast, and as a kid, he never had strong ambitions to join the military. However, after an unsuccessful stint in college left him lacking purpose and low on options, he decided to join the National Guard. Elliot was eventually deployed to Iraq, where he served for a year as an Army combat engineer. When Elliot had finished serving and returned to college at the University of Virginia, he approached his education with a new focus and purpose, and it was there that he discovered writing and journalism. As a journalist, Elliot has traveled everywhere from war-torn regions of the globe to well-known conflicts in the American West, from the Gaza Strip to the front lines of the Keystone XL pipeline protests. Whether reporting on public lands, outdoor adventure, or war, Elliot brings focus and intensity to all of his projects. Elliot and I met years ago, so it was great to reconnect and have an in-depth conversation about his life and career. We started out by discussing his upbringing in Maryland and Pennsylvania, and how he developed a love of the outdoors at an early age. We then discussed his education, his failed first attempt at college, and his path to the military. We talk about his time in Iraq, his career as a journalist, and the origins of the Third Squad podcast. We then talk about the current state of journalism— and Elliot discusses why he feels the need to cover stories that involve dangerous people and places. We talk about hero culture, the importance of having a purpose, how the natural world has been a healing force in Elliot's life, and Elliot offers up some excellent book recommendations. I encourage all of you to check out Third Squad, as well as Elliot's 2016 TED Talk that I referenced in the conversation. There are links to both of those and a lot of other stuff in the episode notes. Thanks again to Elliot for all of his hard work and for joining me for such an important conversation. Hope you enjoy. Can you start by just telling where you grew up, what kind of upbringing you had, and and how you eventually ended up getting into the military? Sure. So I grew up in suburban Washington, D.C. in a place called Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is about 15 miles from Washington, D.C., And my dad was a Navy doctor at Bethesda Naval Hospital, which is why we lived there. My mom was a nurse. So I had a pretty normal suburban childhood, lots of time outside, lots of fishing and drainage ponds and and little creeks and looking for crayfish and shooting pretty much anything that moved with my BB gun and playing in the woods wherever I could find it and that sort of stuff. I was one of, I think I'm one of the last generations of kids that could take my bike and just go wherever I wanted to go and come back at dark. So that was pretty cool. And my dad moved, he got out of the Navy when I was eight and he moved to central Pennsylvania, which was a paradise for me. Mm -hmm. He lived in the middle of the woods and about 
four or five miles from a little town called Lewisburg on the Susquehanna river. So there was tons of fishing and, you know, it was one of these places where I could just get dropped off by one of these creeks that flowed into the Susquehanna and just disappear with a friend of mine all day. And I could walk out the back door into the woods and, you know, walk as far as I possibly could and, and never run out of woods. And I had those two childhoods. I had a suburban childhood and then I had this pretty rural childhood too, because my parents were split up. So I went, I went back to Maryland for high school after living in Pennsylvania for middle school. And I went to a school called Georgetown prep outside of right outside of Washington, DC. And I had come from public school and not just public school, but public school in Pennsylvania. So I didn't know any kids when I started. I really, I think there might've been one kid who I'd known from my childhood in the whole class. Um, but all the other kids came from these feeder schools, these other private schools that, that supplied Georgetown prep with most of their students. And so I had a pretty hard time fitting in for most of my time there. And by my junior year, I was starting to have some disciplinary problems. I was starting to screw around and skip school and get in trouble in class and not do my homework. And my mm -hmm. grades were starting to slip and all that kind of stuff. And by the time I was a senior, that was all really coming to a head. And I got in some trouble. I, I got suspended and I eventually actually got kicked out of high school right before I was supposed to graduate about a month before I was supposed to graduate. So the story is much longer and much more complicated than that. But yeah. that's the gist of it is that basically my parents divorce and just adolescent angst combined into a perfect storm in the latter years of high school for me. And, and that ended up with me getting kicked out of high school and having to repeat my senior year of high school at Valley Forge Military Academy in Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. So I went there and I did really well. I really loved it. I thrived actually in that highly structured environment. And mm -hmm. it was pretty hard academically and it was pretty hard socially. There was almost no freedom at all. And, you know, we had to march to breakfast, march to lunch, march to dinner and wear super orderly uniforms all the time and shine our shoes and all that stuff. Did you want to go there? Like, like, was it a punishment? Was your dad like, you're going whether you wanted to or not? And, and were you dreading it? Or was it the kind of thing where you probably thought it was good for you or maybe a combo of both? Uh, it was a last chance thing. It was a last chance thing. It, it was at the end of that summer after I got kicked out of high school and I had actually kind of run away from home for that summer and came back and my mom and my dad had talked and I was at my mom's house and my mom was saying, you know, we'll find you a room and you can get a job and figure out how to pay for it. And we went and looked at like rooms in people's houses. It was super weird. And, and my dad calls and he says, Hey, I talked to the people at this military school. They said, they've got a spot for you if you want to go. And this is basically your last chance mm -hmm. to get your act together. And so I said, all right. I mean, it happened just like that. It was the phone call because they had already started the the year. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I showed up even a little bit late. I showed up like a week or two weeks late. And so it was just like that. I mean, it was, you can do this or you're out. And so I did, I went and I did really well and got really good grades. And I actually did a semester of junior college there too, and ended up getting into Fordham university in New York city. Mm -hmm. And then I filled out. Same thing happened again. Just no structure, the the no, no structure, structure, and you just like a free for all, just go crazy. Yeah, yeah. and right on the edge of New York City, and yeah. living in the Bronx with bodegas on either corner outside of my apartment. That even though I looked like I was twelve, they would sell me forties, and you know my <laughs> my roommate sold weed, and it was just a terrible, terribly terrible situation for a kid fresh out of basically junior prison. So I failed out and that was really the last, last straw. I mean, that was then, you know, my dad said, well, I hope you had a good time because you're on your own now. So that's when I went back to Richmond, Virginia, and I got a couple of really shitty retail jobs. And one day I came out from work and there was a flyer on my windshield that said, you can have your tuition paid for at any state school, plus a stipend for living expenses and books for the low, low price of two weeks every summer and one week in a month of training with the Virginia army national guard. And I said, where do I sign basically? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, called the recruiter and I was in his office and had signed the paperwork and I didn't even really think about it. I mean, I was just like, I don't have, I'm all out of chances. I do not like where I am. I do not like where this is going. I can see where this is going and it's nowhere good. And I, 
I want more out of my life than this. And I've really fucked my life up and, and it's up to me to make it better. So I think a lot of people find themselves in that situation and turn to the military. And that's exactly what I did. What year was this? So it was July, 2001. Oh, uh huh. So my timing was perfect, (laughs) you know, and that was part of it too, is I, I knew actually in high school at Valley Forge, I had a professor who had served in the Balkans um, or I had to, I guess he was a teacher, but I had a teacher who had served in the Balkans with the army during those Balkan deployments in the nineties. And, you know, I, I knew some people here and there who had served in desert storm, but the last big major, really super scary war was Vietnam. Yeah. And my dad's a Vietnam vet, but by the time 2001 rolled around, when I went and enlisted, that was, you know, almost 30 years in the rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. And so it didn't seem like that kind of thing was going to be in the offing anytime soon. So I certainly didn't join after the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq had started when I had a clear idea of just how serious that commitment was going to be. I might have done it anyway. I don't know. But, you know, I joined at the very end of, of an era. Yeah. Like <laughs> just a few weeks before everything changed. I mean, I, I had About six weeks. You and I remember when we met. We have very similar stories. I mean, I, you know, we went to schools. We may have actually played against each other in sports at some point in high school because I, I went to Woodbury Forest. Oh, that's right. And um, similar thing for me, man, like like as far as Woodbury was unbelievably structured. I mean, we had class on Saturday. And then I got to college and it's just like a damn free-for-all. <laughs> yeah. And and so I, I really identify with your, you know, the mindset of your, of your story. And I remember when we met, I remember thinking like I had a connection with just the way you went about things. Although I had a lot of friends or several friends from high school who joined the Marines right after graduating college, went to officer's candidate school. And that was year 2000. And then they were in it, you know, right after 9-11. So, so you enlist, 9-11 happens, then what? Yeah. So 9-11 happened. And about a month later, I shipped off to basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. So I think it was mid-October 2001, I went to basic. And for combat engineers, which is what I was, basic training and job school are all in one shot. It's all 14 weeks with the same drill sergeants in the same training company at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. So I was there from October until February. And, um, you know, the drill sergeants were saying, you're all going to be shipped out. You're going to be on a plane to Afghanistan as soon as you get out of here. So you better take this seriously. You know, Mm -hmm. they probably screamed it with much worse language than that, but something to that effect. So I thought, you know, well, this is different than what I thought it was going to be, but here I am. And then of course I came home from basic training and Afghanistan was kind of already on the back burner. And then I went back to school because that was the deal with the national guard is they would give me money for college tuition. So I enrolled at Virginia Commonwealth university in Richmond and started taking classes. And I was about two and a half semesters in there. And that's when I started hearing on the radio. This was 2002 by now. I started hearing on the radio these deliberations in Congress about giving George Bush the money to go to war if necessary. Mm -hmm. The authorization for the use of force and the money that went with that. And I was like, what the hell? Didn't we already deal with this guy? I mean, when I was 10 years old, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we already handle this situation? What? It just was totally out of the blue to me. I mean, I was pretty young and not super worldly, but I didn't have my head in the sand either. And I remember listening to NPR and just thinking, this sounds crazy. This, what the, this just sounds like so out of left field. And then a little over a year later, I was there. I was in Iraq. My unit got called up. We're combat engineers. So our primary responsibility was route clearance. So we did a lot of patrols up and down highway one in Iraq, looking for IEDs, which fortunately at that time for us, they're weren't very many of them around, um, in that part of Iraq, Northern Iraq where I was, but yeah, that's how that went down. You know, it all happened pretty fast. And so I spent a year in Iraq near Mosul in the North came home in, I guess, March, February or March, 2005. I can't remember exactly. And then I went back to school. There's a great scene. Well, it's not great, but there's a powerful part at the beginning of your podcast, third squad, where you talk about walking around the mall in Charlottesville, which I've spent plenty of time around there soon after you got back and just wanting to 
flip tables over and scream at all these people because they're all having the time of their life and no idea what you've been through, what's currently going on at that exact moment across the seas. And then there's a really great TED Talk you did that I'll, I'll have embedded on the webpage so people can watch it where you, you talk a bit about this readjustment. So can you, I mean, you don't, you don't have to go through all of it, but, but how was that? I mean, how, how was that returning to school and this super cush life of sitting around studying and, and, you know, no, no real <laughs> pressure one way or the other. I mean, how was that returning to normal life? Yeah, well, it was, I mean, the best way I could describe it would be bipolar or schizophrenic. I mean, it was like simultaneously, I was so happy to be out of there. I was so glad to be home and I was so excited to have what really felt to me like a new lease on life. I mean, toward the end of my tour, we lost two guys to a suicide bombing in the battalion chow hall from my company and a bunch of other people from my company got wounded and I had been on a patrol a couple of months before that where there was an IED strike on the patrol that we drove right through. And fortunately nobody got seriously hurt, but it was like this wake up call of, Oh, they are here. Like this might be a quieter area, but they're definitely here and they're trying to kill you. Um, and so I couldn't wait to get home. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And so coming home, I was super excited to just study and take my education seriously And that's what I did. I mean, I studied my ass off. I was in the library. I basically lived in the library for hours every day and read every single page that was assigned to me or really tried to. And I was running marathons and triathlons and just really living, just like really, really trying to live. And there was a lot of Mm -hmm. guilt involved in that too, because throughout all of that, I was thinking, you know, who am I to slack off at? Nick and David would love to be studying right now. Those are the two guys who were killed, Nicholas Mason and David Rurin from my company. And I I had that going through my head. I still have that going through my head all the time, but it's not as bad anymore. But then on the other side of it, you know, it was really hard because um, I'm looking around. This is 2005. I started at UVA. So I transferred to UVA, which was also a really big deal for me. Sure. Um, Because I was not the kind of kid in high school that thought he'd ever go to a good school or really make much of myself. And so I got in in no small part because I had just come home from Iraq and the admissions committee basically did me a favor. Mm -hmm. I found out later. Um, They weren't going to let me in based on my transcript. So anyway, I took that all very seriously and it was thrilling and it was exciting. But then it was 2005 when I started there. So we'd just come out of the Bush Kerry election, which was really toxic. I was, uh, I was in Iraq when that went down and had just come home when when Bush was serving in his second term and, and things were still really toxic about Iraq. And so there I am at this beautiful college campus with all these young, beautiful, smart students with their whole lives ahead of them. And no one was talking about Iraq at all. It was just not a subject of conversation. And then occasionally when it did come up, it was often because somebody had found out that I served and they're like, oh man, especially these like young college Republican types would be like, oh, that's, you know, that's so cool, man. I would love to do something like that. And I'd be like, well, why don't you? And they'd say, (laughs) well, you know, I got other, basically I got other things to do or it's just not for me or whatever. And I'd say, you know, if you think it's so cool and if you think it's so important, then I can help you get in touch with a recruiter. And that just burned me up. I mean, it just killed me. It just Mm -hmm. killed me to see this really hardcore, chest-thumping, flag-waving nationalism, essentially, among this certain subset of my peers at at UVA that wasn't matched at all by any willingness to serve, Mm -hmm. that wasn't matched at all by any any actual willingness to put their own necks on the line. Mm -hmm. And that was really eye-opening to me. I think that set me on the course to where I am now in a lot of ways. So um, I didn't meet another veteran of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan until the very end of my third year at UVA, my final year. And then in that final year, I took a class and then there were two veterans. There were two Iraq veterans in my class. But before that, it was like, you know, it wasn't even happening at all. And so Mm -hmm. that was pretty brutal, actually. That was pretty rough. So in my final year at school, I was really fortunate to have an internship at the Virginia Quarterly Review, which was this still is this amazing literary magazine that is published independently, but in affiliation with the University of Virginia. And its office was right there on campus. And so I I met the editor, who's a guy named Ted Genoways, and 
he found out about my story and invited me to do this internship. And then he also said, would you like to write a piece about your deployment? Oh, wow. And about your unit. And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. I've never, you know, I've written a lot of term papers, but I don't know how to write a first person narrative essay. I don't know how to interview people. I don't know how to do anything like that. So he said, that's okay. I'll help you. You can do it. And so he kind of held my hand through the whole thing. And that led to me driving all over Virginia to interview guys that I served with about how they were dealing with our deployment in the three years since we'd come home. And it also led me to interview the families of the two guys from my company who died. Oh, wow. So, so that piece became basically a dual profile of those two guys and of their families. Mm -hmm. And then my story and our unit story was kind of woven through. And so I had thought about going to get a PhD in English and becoming an English professor because all I really wanted to do was read books. That's all I really still want to do. If I could, you know, wave a magic wand and be <laughs> free to do whatever I want to do all day, I would just spend all day curled up with a book. We can't have you spending your time that way. You got too much to offer. Like I, I get it, but I'm not going to allow that. If I ever hear that yeah. happening, I'm going to straighten it out. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I'm not making any promises, but. Um, but so I thought about going to grad school for English and I took a couple grad classes during my final year and I just didn't really feel like I fit in in the classroom. And, um, and I went out and did this story for VQR about my unit and I realized, okay, this is what I want to do. This is, this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to be in the world. I want to be the person who goes out and asks questions and tells the story and, and takes a deeper look. And, and that became my mission. Mm -hmm. So Immediately after I graduated from college, I went to Egypt to study. Well, first I finished writing that piece. And then I, that fall in August, I went to Egypt to enroll at the American University of Cairo to study Arabic. And I started freelancing there, writing for the local daily English newspaper. And then in January of 2009, I crossed into the Gaza Strip to report on the war between Israel and Hamas. And then I ended up staying in the Gaza Strip for about a year and a half and during that time, I went to Afghanistan for the first time. I took a break and went to Afghanistan for the first time. And, you know, that's kind of the rest is history, I guess. Do you feel like you have to have a mission, like a goal? Because, I mean, that's I'm not at all comparing myself to anything you've done at all. But I feel like like when I've been at my worst, like college, <laughs> it was because there was no no real mission, you know, no no real pointed purpose that I, something I needed to accomplish. And you mentioned when you got, when you went back to school, you were cranking triathlons and, and running marathons. And, and it seems like we might be wired a little <laughs> similarly for better or worse. I mean, is that, it, and I feel like from outside looking in and, and brief conversations with you that you are laser focused on journalism as a way to make the world better um, and to tell these important stories and to not back down into hold some of these bullies up, you know, for, for trying to bully people around or mislead people. So it seems like to me on the outside that you, you see your career as a journalist as a very, very, very important mission. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah. I think I am basically inert without a mission. Yeah. If I don't feel like I'm needed, if I don't feel like I'm being asked personally to contribute you know, it doesn't have to, not in a literal sense, but if I don't feel truly called and needed, then I just kind of crumble. So I definitely need that sense of a mission to do what I do. And I came home from Iraq with a very clear sense of a mission that mm -hmm. I wanted to find out what happened over there. I wanted to find out why we went there, why it was necessary for my two friends to die and for all of the suffering to happen, why it was necessary for the Iraqis to be put into that position where they had to pay such a steep price for our foreign policy objectives. There were a lot of questions that I came home with and answering them became my mission. And then that mission evolved over the years to telling the story of people like me who saw the worst of, I mean, people like me, I didn't see the worst of the war in Iraq. There were people who had it much worse than I did, but I mean, people like me, young people who wound up there for whatever reason and who lived through hell, um, I, I basically made it my mission to document their stories as much as I could. And I did that for a number of years. Uh, it was very hard. 
because I was a freelancer and I, there aren't a lot of resources for freelancers. So I had to kind of figure out other ways to fund my journalism habit. And, and I was young and it was early in my career. So I didn't always publish in places that had the biggest distribution, but you know, I was doing, I was doing my thing and I, I felt like I was being true to myself and, and true to the story. And, uh, so eventually I started going to Afghanistan a lot in 2009. I went back there five times between 2009 and 2012 and spent usually a month or more each time that I went back. And the last military embed that I went on was the embed with this squad of Marines who are now the subject of this 12 part podcast that's rolling out right now. And so by the time I got there, my sense of a mission was starting to deteriorate because what I realized was that I was taking exceptional risks to tell a story that wasn't really changing. Mm. So it started to feel like, you know, those games, Mad Libs. Yeah. That little kids play where it's like a, it's like a pad and it has a little story on it and there's blanks and you fill in the blanks with silly words. Well, this was like mm -hmm. an evil nightmare version of Mad Libs. It was like the mm. same story, but a different village a different name of a young kid who lost his leg, a different number of people dead from the unit, et cetera. And so I was kind of at the end of my rope. I kind of felt like I didn't really have anything new to say. I didn't really want to take any more photographs of people staring down the barrels of their rifle or of scared Afghan children or anything like that. I was just done. So I was there and I did this embed and I thought this is going to be it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this again. Um, and then I, I went home and I, had been home for about a month and a half. And, uh, I had just gotten the film back from these portraits that I took of the guys from the squad. And I saw an alert on my computer monitor as I was scanning these portraits in with my film scanner that two Marines had been killed in Afghanistan in Helmand province where I had just been. And one of them was a guy named Michael Dutcher, who was one of the guys in the squad. And I was just about to scan his picture in. <laughs> And so that just, I mean, that just floored me. I was, it took a long time to recover from that. And so I hadn't made a hard choice at that point, not to go back and do more military reporting, but I kept deferring it. I kept putting it off. I kept, I canceled an embed after that. And it was probably about a year or so after that, that I realized that I had made a choice that I wasn't going to do this anymore, that I was going to, you know, I was going to allow myself to live my life and start to think about other things. Mm -hmm. And so that's what eventually led to me starting to focus more on adventure writing and environmental reporting and domestic issues, American politics at home. It's what eventually led to me moving out to Montana. So, but that came with a huge amount of guilt, a huge amount of guilt that I still feel to this day, although working on this project has obviously been very good for that. But, you know, I always felt like I turned my back on that story. I always felt like I, quit. Like I abandoned that mission that I'd given myself. So that's a big part of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Now that I love hearing that backstory, because I feel like I knew some of it, you know, between talking with you and then reading about you, I, but I didn't know it all. I mean, having it all lined up like that. I mean, that when I hear this stuff, whether it's you or other military folks I've had on the podcast, it, I mean, maybe I'm a narcissist because it just comes back straight to me, but I'm like, I haven't done anything, man. <laughs> like, like I've just been kind of playing games, you know, as like when you were over there, I just think about you talking about Oh five and what was I doing in Oh five? I mean, that's part of the re that's one of the many reasons I wanted to have you on here. Cause I, I think the podcast and then just your story, it really, it's made me personally think long and hard about the way I spend my time, you know, and I, I'll never contribute in the way that you or these guys you're covering did, but it's, um, I think it's a good thought exercise to keep things in line. Um, See, I don't know if that's, I don't know if I agree with that. And cause that's the thing is like when I was getting upset at those kids who were like, Oh man, that's so cool. And I was like, well, if you think it's so cool, why don't you go do it? Mm -hmm. The reality is that I didn't want anybody to have to do it. I didn't want anybody to be there. If I could have brought everybody home right then and said, let's cut our losses and go. Mm -hmm. I would have. I mean, that might've been a disaster for Iraq. I don't know. But there was talk at that point. There was talk at that point of, you know, remember the quote, cutting and running accusations. Yeah. So that's the thing is like, 
yes, people who serve in the military in a time of war who actually are in, especially people who are in combat units and confront all of the, the violence and trauma and loss involved in that, there is a sacrifice there. There is an incredible sacrifice. But I would prefer that we don't put people in that position in the first place unless there's absolutely no other way to deal with the situation. And I don't think that was the case in Iraq. And I don't think that was the case in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. So people have asked me like, cause I, I'm often, you know, I'm a mildly opinionated person <laughs> and I have a, an issue with what I call hero culture in the United States right now. I get pretty tired of hearing people hearing every single military service member who's, who's ever raised their hand and, and sworn the oath of enlistment called a hero or a mm-hmm. warrior Um, I think hero used to be a word that was, that was guarded a little more closely and it was never something that you used to describe yourself. And so, you know, people say, well, you know, don't, do you believe in heroes at all? And I say, yeah, but I don't think you have to go to war to be one. I mean, my heroes are Mm -hmm. Rosa Parks. Like I sat in the, in the bus that Rosa Parks had her stand her protest on at the, uh, Henry Ford museum in Detroit, or it's actually in Dearborn when I was in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I had the biggest lump in my throat. They played her voice over a speaker in the bus talking about why she did it. And I was like, man, like this is like, I try to imagine what it was like to be her in that moment in that place in America. And in that time in America with basically you're, you're the loner in a sea of terrorists essentially. Mm -hmm. And I like, it almost takes my breath away. So I think people do compassionate, heroic, selfless things every day in this country that we almost never notice. And I think we actually have a little bit of a problem in terms of how much we value military service and that form of heroism or sacrifice over other forms of heroism and sacrifice. So I guess what I'm saying is don't sell yourself short, man. Yeah, (laughs) There's, There's a lot that you can do here that is just as important as anything that anybody does in uniform. And maybe some vets would jump down my throat for saying that. I don't really care. I mean, the fact is that we got a lot of really, really hard work to do here. And there are a lot of people who are doing it because it's the right thing to do, not because anybody's looking, Mm -hmm. not because there's a ton of money involved in it or recognition or fame. They're just doing it because it has to be done. And Mm -hmm. if there's one thing that you take out of military service, it's that. If I don't do this, who will? You see a piece of of trash on the sidewalk, you pick it up and you throw it away. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you realize that if you don't do it, somebody else is going to have to do it. And the bigger the task, the more easy it is to, or the easier it is to punt that off to somebody else. Sure. So there are people in this country right now, whether it's on conservation or poverty solutions or public health or whatever the issue is, there are people who are quietly and selflessly dedicating their lives to a mission that they've taken upon themselves. And I think that's heroic. And I think it's just as heroic as anything that anybody does in in uniform. Well, I I agree with you. I mean, I think that's, I appreciate that. I think there's certain things that can be seen as, is pretty straightforward, you know, like, like I think when, and when there's like life and death on the line, like in the military or, you know, you even see, you know, in our, in our current worlds of this, you know, adventure type things, these, some of these mountain climbers, you know, it's, it's life or death. You, you, you could die doing it. And I think that, it strips away a lot of stuff and you can just pretty quickly admire somebody for that. But when you look at the messiness of some of these other heroes, like Rosa Park, for example, I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, now looking back in hindsight, obviously it was a, the right thing to do, but you imagine being in her head and weighing all the different ways this could go. It's not just like, Hey, I don't, I'm, I can't die. It's like my family, my neighborhood, you know, just this endless calculus of trying to figure out, can I take this risk? So now I appreciate that. See, that's exactly why I want to talk to you. You're making me think about things. So I want to, I want to come back to the podcast, obviously, but, but real quick, while you're talking about this, you know, non-military work, I feel like in a lot of your writing, and I mean, I haven't read every word of it, but a lot of what I've read is you you approach these subjects that you're trying to, these stories you're trying to tell with a, a fearlessness and like the, the one that two that come to mind are the profile you did on Ryan Zinke in outside a few years back. And then 
one that I was not aware of until I read Ryan Bussey's book, um, Gunfight, and he talks about you and how you kind of went undercover in this you know, this NRA event. And um, I feel like that takes a level of bravery that, again, it's not just not like you're going to get killed. Well, maybe with the, some of those NRA people, but it's not. But it, it's this. I, Ryan Zinke is not going to like me. And he's got some power and he's going to be pissed and he's going to know my name and know that I'm the guy that outed him for not being <laughs> rig, rig his fly ride and, and among other things and uh, that are a lot worse than that. And so how do you do, like, how do you deal? When did you decide in your career, in your journalism career, like I'm going to go hard and I don't care, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to do it the ethical way, but I'm not going to be scared of these guys because everybody else is. And I'm not going to I'm not going to back away from important stories because somebody's a bully. Well, the short answer is that I am scared of them. I, I think we're in a place in American history right now and American cultural evolution where the threat of violence has actually crossed over into the direct application of violence and journalists are in the crosshairs. Mm -hmm. And so I am scared of them. I mean, I, I, so the event you're talking about was actually the national shooting sports foundation shot show. Okay. Yeah. Which is not an NRA event, but the NRA obviously has a pretty big footprint there. Um, but what you probably don't know is that I went to the NRA national convention that same year, a couple oh, of months later. I didn't know that. And I didn't end up writing about it. Um, I just kind of filed it away for something to use later, but I got a VIP pass and I sat down in the floor for the convention speeches when Wayne LaPierre and several other Cox, Chris Cox and several other high profile NRA people were giving their speeches. And I forget who was talking. I think it was Chris Cox, but they did this video montage of all of the journalists who they thought had spoken ill of the NRA and who ought to be basically targeted by you know, the legions of, of NRA <laughs> supporters online or whatever. So it was like clip after clip of news anchors and, you know, headlines from magazine stories. So I'm sitting there down on the floor, like all these NRA, you know, diehards are there and I've got a name tag on with my name, you know, it's me. And I had just gone on Dana Lash's NRA TV TV show to basically debate her. <laughs> I've written this story and she she had me on to basically yell at me and and in a phrase that would be familiar to nra supporters i stood my ground <laughs> i stood i made my stand uh -huh. anyway it was a pretty contentious thing and so i'm sitting there thinking they're gonna put that clip this they're gonna play that clip and i'm gonna be sitting here and all everybody's gonna look at me and realize who i am oh. and i i felt a dread in that room I think I would have felt it anyway if I hadn't worried about that clip popping up. But the dark energy that I felt in that room as people cheered on these attacks on journalists who are trying to report on this very serious issue in our country, it was one of the most chilling things I've ever experienced in my life. And that says so a lot. They do scare me. But, you know, one of the things I learned in the military is that you can't let fear get in the way of the mission. You have an objective. It has to be accomplished and you set your fear aside and you go forward. And this is something that journalists do all day, every day. And, you know, I'm a magazine writer. I don't publish that much just because of the way magazines work. And there are reporters who cover these issues for newspapers and weekly magazines who are out there talking to people, putting themselves in these situations every single day. People who are writing about cartels, people who are writing about <laughs> You know, people are writing about polluters who who have literally killed people with their negligent pollution. And that takes a tremendous amount of courage. And so I'm by no means the only person doing that. And for me, it is scary. And I wish that it were not like that. And I wish that the last president of the United States hadn't gone out of his way to to make journalists the target of popular rage in this country. Mm -hmm. I think that's exceptionally dangerous. And I've worked and lived in places in the world where Journalists are regularly arrested, beaten, kidnapped, killed, and it doesn't make me feel good at all to think that we may become one of those places soon. I mean, my, my governor assaulted a journalist and won the special election the very next day. That was when he was running for Congress. 
And, you know, I, I had a, just a chilling anecdote about that incident. I was freelancing occasionally for the guardian at the point at that point. And it was a guardian reporter named Ben Jacobs who got assaulted by Greg Gianforte. And this is not, um, rumor. I'm not being careless with my words. Greg Gianforte pled guilty to assault. I mean, he has criminal, this is a matter of, mm -hmm. of settled law. So he assaulted Ben Jacobs and all of that went down. And at the time I was fact checking a story about public land ranchers. And I got in touch with this ranching family up in North central Montana who I'd been writing about and wanted to clarify a few things with them. So the, the woman of the house picks up the phone. I'm not going to mention their names right now, but she's friendly. She says, Hey, Elliot, how's it going? You know, everything's fine. Blah, blah, blah. And she says, Hey, I just want to ask you, I know that you're doing this story for the guardian. And we saw that thing about what that guardian reporter did to Greg Gianforte. And I just want to know what is this story really about the story you're working on? What do you, what is this really about here? Yeah. In other words, the way that that filtered back to their community was that Greg Gianforte had basically no other choice, mm -hmm. that he was put in a position by these hostile, nasty questions from this uppity reporter that the only, po the only possible response was violence. Yeah. That was how I read that. Mm -hmm. And that scared the shit out of me. Not like tremble in my boots scared, but like, oh my God, like we've gotten to a point where that kind of violence by a high ranking political hopeful is just acceptable. That's so the thing does. that's so scary to me is just the, the slipping of, of norms, social norms, you know, things that, that would have had somebody running for the, the Hills never to be seen again in public life. Now, not only is it accepted, you know, whether it's like filthy language or bullying or make, you know, making fun of people who died in a war's parents, you know, that kind of thing. It, it yeah. just, all these norms are gone. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I don't feel like that's, that's not a political statement. That's just, it's very strange how the sense of normalcy is just gone. It just evaporated. Yeah. I agree with you. It's not good and it's not funny. I, I don't think it's funny at all. Well, here's a question for you that I've struggled with. I feel like a lot of news now it, you know, it's, they're paid by the click. And so crazier or the more negative or the more scary things are, the more clicks they get. And that's, that's what it seems like. And yet, and so I understand, like, I feel like you're a perfect example of a journalist that looks clearly at very complex issues and writes them out, writes about them or presents them in a way that, that makes sense, that gives you the full scoop. But there's a lot out there and it's just it, to me and correct me if I'm wrong, but it comes off as just straight up complaining. And it's, it's just like, all oh, the, everything sucks. These people on the other side are awful and it's on both sides. But like, I see it a lot in like Western focus media and it, there's no solution yet. I'm in the conservation business and all day long I'm working with people that are some really, really smart, really, really aggressive people that are finding solutions to a lot of these really complicated problems. And so like part of me is like, I don't want, I don't want to just hear people dwelling on how awful it is. I want to hear solutions, but at the same time, I don't want to have my head in the sand, ignoring all the bad stuff that's going on. But I feel like there, there should be more focus on solution oriented journalism and solution, solution oriented stories. But I don't even know if that's an option because at the end of the day, it doesn't make as much money. Tell me where I'm wrong I, there. Yeah. I, it's a great question. Uh, it's something I hear a lot. Um, so there's a word for it. It's called solutions journalism. Mm -hmm. And it is something that is gaining traction, or it's at least something that a lot of people are talking about. I think the big problem there is that that's not really our job. Our job is to look at where things stand right now and what's going on and to help you understand the, the mechanics behind the sound bites, behind the pat versions of the story that the public relations people want to tell you or that the politicians want to tell you on their stump speech or whatever. We mm -hmm. basically want to break past the advertising and the myth making and the surface to show you what's actually happening. And often enough, we go where the problems are. We don't go where things are great because mm -hmm. there's almost nothing for us to report there. And you are right that if it bleeds, it leads. You know, if it, 
if if something's seriously wrong, if there's a if there's a crisis happening, then then that's going to draw a lot more attention than smooth sailing. That's what makes a story. You know, mm-hmm. Sebastian Younger's book, A Perfect Storm, wasn't about wasn't about fishing in New England on a clear, perfect day. Yeah. You know, it's like that wouldn't have been a blockbuster film. It would have been pretty boring. Sure. So, we are the watchdog. That's our job. And watchdogs look out for threats. They look out for problems. So I think part of the problem is that asking us to look more at solutions and report more on solutions is also asking us to get into speculative terrain because most solutions are in a process of being tested or proven. Mm-hmm. They haven't worked out yet. If they've worked out, then the problem's not there anymore. And so we're not going to, we're going to, we, we have very limited resources. We're going to focus on where the problem is. So I don't mean mm-hmm. to dodge this, but I sort of think like, so I get this question a lot, like, okay, you've illuminated the problem, but what do I do about it? And I'm like, I went out and explained the problem and, and, and dug up information about the problem for you so that you, this, the citizen as part of a community can go solve the problem. Mm-hmm. That's your job. That's the community's job. But I sympathize with the psychological effect of a deluge of bad news. It is a well, grim landscape out there. It is a grim information landscape out there. And I sympathize with that. I mean, I open the newspaper every morning and, and it's pretty freaking depressing. It's, there's not a lot of light and it's like, no matter which direction you look on which issue, it's bad everywhere. All signs are bad. It's like mm-hmm. red alarm lights going off everywhere. And I don't think it's going to stop being that way for a long time. So I do sympathize with that. And, uh, and I do think it's important for journalists to write about leaders, thought leaders, change makers, people who are making a difference. And maybe we can do a little bit more of that, but I just don't want to throw, I don't want to throw hardworking journalists under the bus who are doing their best to make the public aware of problems that would be otherwise invisible. And I also want to make it clear that because of the death of local journalism and regional journalism, there is so much terrible shit going on that you have no idea about Mm -hmm. because there's nobody to report on it. Yeah. So there are all these places where maybe you think everything's okay and it's not because there's nobody there to ask the questions. There's nobody there to dig into the files. There's nobody there to watch the city council meeting or, or the legislative session. So yeah, it's a pretty, pretty tough thing. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I am a realist. And I'm not a cynic. Have you always been a realist or, or has that been an evolution over everything you've seen, whether it's overseas or in your reporting domestically? Like, has your personality changed? Yeah, it has. So I think when I was younger in my 20s, I was pretty, pretty cynical, actually. I think I was very cynical and very jaded. And I think that as I've gotten older, I've learned to give people the benefit of the doubt as a default setting. I really try to, that's just a requirement of the job. If I want to do this job well, I have to assume that everybody's trying to do the best they can. Normal people. I'm not talking about people who are in positions of great power because I usually talk to normal people. Most of the people I write about are just normal people like you and me. They're not famous. They're not powerful. You know, they don't have any special influence over anything. They're just trying to get by. And so I might not like the person I'm talking to. I might find their opinions distasteful. I might disagree strongly with them on issues, but I try to start with an assumption that people are getting by and doing the best they can and that they came from somewhere and they are the way they are for a huge complex set of reasons that only probably has a little bit to do with personal choice. Mm -hmm. And, and that's true of me too. So that has made me less cynical. It hasn't made me more optimistic, but it's made me less cynical. In Mm -hmm. other words, I don't expect the worst out of people. And there is a little bit of hope that emerges from that. And so I can be pretty pessimistic. Sometimes I can have a pretty dark view of things. And, you know, when I look at the available information and try to synthesize it and make predictions about where everything is leading and where we're going, I don't see a lot of hope. I think things are going to get a lot worse before they get better on a lot of issues. But I think to do the kind of work that I do, you have to be optimistic. You have to, your optimism has to outweigh your pessimism because otherwise why do it? I mean, I do the work that I do because I do think that change is possible. And I do think that every one of us out here who's doing this kind of work 
is, you know, dropping a grain of sand on the hopeful side of the scale and hoping that eventually it tips. That's all any of us can really do. I don't, I don't have any hopes that anything that I do is going to change the world by itself. But I do think that all of us who are out here trying to shine the light into the dark places, so to speak, are, are making the possibility of change a little bit greater. No, I, I was, I was hoping you would say that because it, you know, the stuff you talk about and write about is super intense and can be kind of downer is not a, a, pro, a, a good description of it, but it's not, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's not the it's most okay. exciting. I mean, it's not like we're all happy and smiling and laughing our asses off at this. You're not a SNL uh, sketch writer, but I feel like you would have to be an optimist because it's too damn hard. What you do is too damn hard if you didn't think it was going to make a difference. Um, you know, optimism, realism, whatever you want to call it, but it's not, you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't think it was going to make a difference. It's too hard. Or maybe you're just a... Glutton no, for punishment. I am a glutton for punishment, but <laughs> nothing, nothing would be worth this unless I thought that, that it could make a difference. And sometimes I believe that more than others. You know, I wake up every day and get dressed and suit up and, and go back out there. And there are a lot of days I think I'm going to get my ass kicked today. Mm -hmm. This isn't, I'm not going to convince myself today. This is one of the days where I'm going to come home thinking, this is completely pointless. Why am I doing this? It's not worth the abuse. I can tell you it's definitely not worth the money. There's no money. There's no money in it. There are much, much easier ways to make a living, but I do believe that it's worth it. And you know, I'm also, I guess the other way that I've changed is I've, I made a huge pendulum swing to being pretty idealistic in my youth and in my early twenties to being more, um, more of an existentialist, I think more of a, a cynic in that way. And now I've swung back to really seeing beauty in so many places that I look and seeing really believing in ideals again, ideals like beauty and honor and loyalty and truth, selflessness. I believe very deeply in these ideals, even though I know that everything is absurd and the sun is going to explode and annihilate everything. Like that. <laughs> so eventually uh, it's just in my DNA, you know, it's just in my DNA to, to really believe in these things and they motivate me and they give me peace. They give me, um, they give me courage and they give me peace. So I believe in the truth. I believe in the value of the truth. And I believe that helping the truth spread, mm -hmm. helping awareness of the truth spread is, is something that's worth doing. And so that's what I, that's what journalists do. So I can live with that. Even if that's all it is, even if it's just a quixotic, foolish belief, it's, it's enough for me. I actually read during my fellowship in Michigan at the university of Michigan, I got to take a Don Quixote course and I read Don Quixote and I didn't, you know, I knew the basics of the story before, but I came away from that thinking, man, I would much rather be Don Quixote than one of the people who's making fun of Don Quixote. Yeah. Even though he's ridiculous, even though he's tilting at windmills and getting all these people hurt and, you know, I mean, he's causing all these problems and, but he believes in, in doing something in the world. He believes in getting out of your house and going out and trying to make a difference. And he's, you know, Cervantes makes a mockery of Don Quixote, but it's very obvious that Cervantes also loves Don Quixote. Yeah. I need and to read I, that. I've I, never read it. I would... I would much rather be Don Quixote than any of the people who stand on the sidelines and mock him. I completely agree with that. The man in the arena. Who As wants to be TR said the man in the arena. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. One more, one more question. Cause we're already bumping up on time, which we're going to have to do another one of these. I'm just going to pretend like we're doing a podcast so I can talk with you and then, Oh, sorry. It didn't work. Um, that's going to be my, okay. my technique for getting yeah, life advice fine. from you. So how has Montana, the landscape of Montana played into your, your whole journey. Cause I would imagine, I mean, we're similar coming from Virginia, East coast. I mean, I'm from North Carolina, but I mean, just the landscape of the West being outdoors, having adventures in the, you know, in the mountains, getting our ass kicked a little bit out in the woods. How has that, how has nature for lack of a better term kind of played a role in your journey, not just as a journalist, but as a, as a human. Nature and particularly wilderness, whether it's a small, wild, preserved place that's in the middle of a very populated place or whether it's true wilderness like you find here in Montana. I live, I mean, I'm looking out my window right now and I'm 
almost looking at the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness. It's on the other side of the road. But um, those kinds of places have been such a source of, of restorative peace to me. They have really saved me in so many ways. And I think what I get out of nature is a healthier, more beautiful and peaceful version of what I got when I was spending time in war zones or in conflict zones is in those places. I felt very alive because I was always basically ready or waiting to die. And I knew that the threat of death was everywhere around me all the time. And I was confronted with people for whom death was not some abstraction that they would confront in 40 or 50 years, but something that, that was around them all day, every day. And that infected me as well and became part of my being. And then I came home to the peaceable, safe, clean world where people do expect to live forever and they make plans as if they're going to live forever. And it was really alienating to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't hold it against them. You know, ideally everybody would have that freedom in a, in a peaceful world, but it felt kind of alienating to me. So getting out into nature and also by the time I had spent all that time overseas and in these, you know, reporting on places where desperation is the norm, I I'd grown pretty jaded and started to see the world as a pretty dark place. So being out in nature makes me feel small in a way that I think is really healthy for my ego and for my being. And it reminds me of my place in the natural world. It helps me not take myself or the world so seriously because I am reassured that the world is going to keep going no matter what I do or no matter what humans do. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of time scales that are much longer than an individual human life or an individual political cycle or any of the other things that I'm caught up in in my daily life. It just, it just slows everything down and almost makes time disappear. You know, the only time that matters when I'm out on the river or out in the woods is where the sun is. And if I start to get stressed out about time, it's because I'm like, fuck, I have to go back to work. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, that's it. It's like, that's it, man. That's it. You know? And so that's been really, really good for me. And I really cherish it. And I honestly think it's life-saving. I honestly think it, it has not only made my life better and made me a better person, a healthier person, but I think it's actually life-saving. I think it has saved my life in many ways. I'm, I know that medicine is always there. And like I said, you know, for me, wilderness more broadly speaking can be the little slice of the Yellowstone river that runs through Livingston where I can walk down there with my dog and I can sit on the bank and I can watch ducks flying around and peek around and look for the blue heron who hangs out in the side channel. And I can, you know, stand on the, on the bank and look down for trout pulling up underneath the foam line and, um, and realize that all this water is rushing out of this super deep cold lake way up in Yellowstone park. Yeah. And it's going to make its way to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's just like, even just right there in this little place where there's cars going by, you know, you can hear the train, you can see the cars on I 90. It's like the universe is gonna, is gonna be okay. I'm just this little tiny thing in it. And, uh, and I can take a deep breath and just let it go for a little while and then get back to work, you know? I agree completely. That's the same way I think about it. You said it a lot more eloquently than I'm capable of saying it, but I agree. All right, real quick, give me some book recommendations. It could be your okay. favorite books of all time or books you've recently read and recommend. But since you read so much, I need some good ones. Okay, well, the most important book to me growing up that I think – set me on the path to where I am now in terms of my love of the outdoors and nature was where the red fern grows by Wilson Rawls, which I hi highly recommend returning to. If you're a grown up, if you're a salty old grown up and you read where the red fern grows when you were, were a kid, but you haven't gone back to it, it's a short mm -hmm. read and it's just as good the hundredth time. Nice. So that's a good one. I'd like to say also, I'm talking about kids books, I think, because I have nieces and nephews who are getting older now. So all these things are back in my mind, but Gary Paulson just died. Yeah. Hat hatchet was a hugely influential book for me. I'm reading that with my six year old right now. We, we got two chapters left and it's just been the coolest experience sitting down with her every night and reading that it's, I was hoping you would say that. Yeah. Hatchet is, is really a masterpiece. And I think it's touched the lives of so many so many people, 
I'm trying to think of, uh, so since I am making this podcast now about the war in Afghanistan and, and veterans, I think I should mention some books that speak to that. So three books that are at the very top of my mind right now are slaughterhouse five by Kurt Vonnegut, which yep. has an alternate title, which is the children's crusade. And the older I get, the more I realize that the people that we send off to fight and die and kill in these wars are basically children. The majority of them are children. And I think most of us Americans have a visceral and very negative reaction to the idea of child soldiers. And when we think mm -hmm. about 12 year old or 14 year old kids who are enlisted to, you know, do dirty work for the pirates in Somalia or for bands of, of bandits in central Africa or, or anywhere like that. But for some reason we have this cognitive dissonance where we think that a 17 year old who enlists in the Marine Corps with their parents signature is an adult mm -hmm. and ready to make that choice on their own and understands what they're getting into. And they don't, they really don't, they're kids. And so slaughterhouse five, I think to me is, is maybe the most important war novel of the 20th century. And, and it's a beautifully written, funny and dark book that illuminates so much about the human soul at war and home from war. I'd recommend that to everyone. And then there's a book by a Nobel prize winning author named Svetlana Alexievich called the Zinky boys. Okay. Z -I -N -K -Y. And it's an oral history of the Soviets in Afghanistan. And I don't think anything's been written about the Afghanistan war by an American author yet that does such a good job of, of bringing to life the experience of, of military personnel caught up in a, in a perplexing war with unclear goals who, who are asked to pay an incredibly high price and whose families are asked to pay an incredibly high price. I'd recommend that to anyone. I just reread the things they carried by Tim O'Brien, mm -hmm. probably the sixth or seventh time because I was working on this podcast and needed a little bit of inspiration that holds up just as well after so many reads. I mean, I could go on forever. I could give you a trillion thousand billion books. Um, all the more reason to do a part two. <laughs> so nope. those are, those are, those are some books that are, that are on my mind right now. Actually, let me give another shout out here. And this one's really important. Sports is not my thing. I, I grew up with two older sisters and a single mom. So I didn't watch sports on TV when I was a kid, but my friend Abe Streep has just come out with a book about the R Lee boys class C basketball team from Ireland, I've been emailing Montana. with Abe. I want to get him on the podcast, put in a good word for me. I will. And that book is one of the most beautifully written accounts of a, a community's soul that I've ever encountered. It's truly spectacular. And you know, the first couple hundred pages are all about the basketball team's pursuit of back-to-back -back state championships in Montana. Mm -hmm. And the writing of the sports scenes of the basketball scenes is just electric. And again, I'm not a sports fan. And I was like on the edge of my seat waiting for the ball to drop every single time. But then where, where Abe truly excels is he has such a keen eye for detail and he has such a keen eye for the telling facial gesture, body language expression. And he's so good at building in pauses. He's so good at not asking the question when what the story needs is a pause and, and giving people space to tell their stories in their words and honoring that. And so it's just a beautiful, haunting, rich, complicated story that I think should, I think everybody in Montana should read it. Yeah, he was, uh, somebody introduced me to him and uh, I have not read the book yet, but we've been emailing a bit. I think he's finishing up a book tour, but I'm hoping he'll come on. And so, um, I'm, I'm excited to read it and have a conversation. That's, that's really small world. I mean, I was just, I was just looking at an email from him like two days ago. It's called All right. Brothers on Three, by the way. It's called Brothers on Three by Abe Streep. Sweet. I'll put links yeah. to that in the notes. All right. Last question. Leave us with some words of wisdom. You've already left us with a lot, but just, you know, you've, you've got so much, so many interesting perspectives, everything from, you know, being a soldier, international, you know, war correspondent to a champion for public lands to just a, a journalist who says he's scared, but he acts like he's not scared to stand up to power. <laughs> and so how, how do you want to wrap this up? I guess if I have one wish most days when I'm out, moving around in the world and watching other people 
interact and go about their business. I guess I just hope everybody will, will try to do better. I just think we can all do better. I think we can all be more generous with each other. I think we can all be more open and forgiving of each other. I think we can all expect more of ourselves with regard to the future that we're trying to build together. And I think we have to start recognizing that we form part of a big community and we can't get through the future without each other. And so we all have to start doing a little bit better every day. I think that's great, man. Well, thank you for everything you do. I love the podcast, like absolutely love it. Um, I'll have links to that in the, in the episode notes. It's important, man. Like a lot of the podcasts I listen to, I'm like laughing and giggling while I'm over there doing the dishes and yours is, is, I mean, I'm, I'm a better person for having listened to it. And so, um, I'm excited to see where it goes. I'm excited to see where your career continues to go, man. You're a, a big source of inspiration and education for me. So keep up the good work. Well, thank you for that. And I appreciate you having me on the show. Hope we can do it again someday. Hey, it's Ed again. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I know your time is valuable. So it means the world that you spend it listening. If you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow, there are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread. So I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon. And there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prey stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four, I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally, check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprey.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn. So look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support.